Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Han Kim. Um, I'm a professor in the public health program here. And the name was a little bit, ooh, remote. The name was a little bit of bait and switch. I apologize, I'm not going to be talking about poop and condoms all that much. Well, my students have accused me, that's all I talk about, I guess, is poop and condoms. Poop because it is important in public health, and condoms because, you know, they're an important tool in public health as well. Banana flavored, cool. All right, so what I want to talk to you about today, though, is public health in the 21st century. We have some significant challenges to public health uh, going forward from this time on. So before I get to that, what is public health? So public health is all about prevention. A doctor, of course, treats a patient that, that already has a disease. We want to prevent that from ever happening. Okay, so we're talking about, we're all about what causes disease and preventing that from happening in populations and communities. So before I get started, I want to go through a little bit of the history of public health. So imagine yourself back in 1840s, 1850s London. And it was really grim. You know, people were dying of cholera and tuberculosis. And people were, were getting into industrial accidents. There was no sewage system. Um, and <laughs> I, you guys have probably all seen this. And you guys laugh at it. But this was what life was like in London back then. Right? And so in 1853, there was a huge cholera outbreak in Soho in London. And a gentleman named Jon Snow, not this Jon Snow, <laughs> this Jon Snow famously removed the pump handle in the neighborhood and showed that cholera wasn't caused by magic or by bad air. It was caused by tainted water. And since then, we've made some incredible strides in public health. We have created um, sewage systems. This is actually a pumping station uh, for sewage in London. Uh, it looks like a brew pub, except it's poo and not beer. <laughs> Condoms, of course, family planning, vaccinations, car safety, auto safety, occupational safety, control of infectious diseases, management of heart disease, food safety, maternal child health, fluoridation of water, and showing that cigarettes are really, really bad for you. <laughs> so, and this has made a huge, this has a, has a huge effect on our health. If you look at this, we've gained, since about 1850, 1860, we've gained 40 years. Back then, they, people used to live about 40 years. And so you can see that our lifespan has doubled. In fact, I'm in my second life now. It's not midlife. It's, I'm starting my second life. <laughs> and since 1900, we've gained 30 years in life expectancy, and 25 of those were because of public health interventions. So we're in really good shape. So, but the challenges still remain. And I'm going to talk to you about redefining public health to meet some of these challenges. First off, I want to talk about expanding the scope of public health. So right now, when we, talk about, when we think about public health, we think about these outcomes, heart disease, stroke, tooth decay. So these are some of the traditional outcomes that we talk about when we talk about public health. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these in, in the, the media. There's a lot of talk about these, all these studies. I propose, though, we expand the scope to cover some non-traditional ways, non-traditional outcomes. These are all public health issues. We can tackle these using public health. Right now, we treat them, we basically deal with them with the, uh, the legal system. And that's like a doctor trying to cure a disease that's already happened. We want to prevent these. We want to find the causes of these issues and prevent them. For example, drug abuse. Right now, we're taking a much more public health approach to it. Colorado is a perfect example. Right now, of course, it's a great experiment going on in there, legalization of um, Marijuana, right, um, of recreation marijuana. Right now, there's some really interesting data coming out. Of course, there's going to be a lot of tax revenue coming in. Um, but the initial data says that uh, the rates of overdose from prescription, prescription drug abuse have been reduced. So that's a positive for me. I mean, prescription drug abuse, to me, is a much more significant problem than marijuana abuse. We also need to redefine the determinants of health. So these, of course, and you see this all the time, right? And you're inundated with news about physical activity and chocolate and how 
Artificial sweeteners are making you obese. That's the big news right now. Coffee can prevent cancer or cause cancer, depending on the study. <laughs> so, and these are the traditional, and this is the way we target these um, in traditional public health. And the problem is, though, we need to start looking downstream because these aren't the true causes. For example, we tell people to eat healthy, but what if you're poor and live in a neighborhood where you have no access to fresh food? There's no Whole Foods there for, us, for you, them to go to. They work two, three jobs, but there's a McDonald's and there's a corner store and all that's available is processed food. So we need to redefine these determinants of health. We need to go further downstream. And these are, this is the challenge here. These are the new determinants of public health. This is the challenge. And these are some really big topics, big isms. And it's going to take a lot to deal with these. OK, so I'm going to show you some data here, because I'm an epidemiologist. I like data. OK, so we need to talk about social justice. So here's our, here's our data again. Now, one of the issues with all these new developments in public health is that it hasn't affected everybody equally. For example, this is India. If you're born in India, you will live 10 years less than if you were born here. If you are born in Malawi, it's even worse. If you're born in Malawi, you're expected to live only 55 to 55. And if you're in Sierra Leone, and it's even worse. Sierra Leone, you expect to live to only 45. I should be dead right now if I was born in Sierra Leone. That's, that is absolutely appalling. It is absolutely appalling. You might say, well, these countries are poor, and it's true. You look at all the poor countries, they're all get clustered. You notice this is income and life expectancy, they're all clustered here. It's sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, if you're wealthy, you live to be much into the 80s. That's a 40-year gap in today's world. It's a 40-year gap. And so the question we should be asking is, why aren't these countries developing? It isn't they're poor, so they're going to be unhealthy. It's why aren't they developing? And it's back to those isms. You know, for example, in Africa, you have to know about colonialism, the legacies of colonialism, to truly understand what's going on in Africa. Ebola is a perfect example. What causes Ebola is poverty. That's, that's it, it, you're, I mean, yeah, Ebola causes it, of course. But really, it's due to poverty. Would this have spread like this in the US? No, it would not have. Right? And it's not just life expectancy. This is uh, physical violence in the developing world. And you look at that, and you realize, holy, crap, holy cow, 70% of women in rural, rural Peru have experienced physical or sexual violence, or both. And, 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 and it's just appalling, these numbers. And it just it boggles, would boggle the mind. There it is. It boggles the mind what's going on. There we go. And some of these numbers, again, they're just staggering. All right? For example, 60 to 100 million girls are missing in the role. Why? Because of gender side, because of the preference towards males. Okay? And it just keeps going on and on. Okay? And it's just, it's just appalling. Ebola, 1.4 million by, by January. Again, why poverty? Okay? So, we need to start talking about these downstream social determinants of health. But it's hard. These are, these are really, really big, big things happening. And it's happening in the US as well. This is New Orleans, this life expectancy. And it's a 25-year gap, depending on what, what zip code you're, you're living in. Okay? And this, this, again, it just shows that if you're a white male in Washington, you live 25 years longer than if you're a black male. Female's not quite as bad, but still significantly worse, right? And you're thinking, well, it's socioeconomic status, right? African Americans are poor. But even after adjusting for it, this is percent of low birth weight babies, even after adjusting for it, African American women still suffer higher rates. And why is that? There's no biological reason for that. It's all about racism. It's all about the everyday indignities that African Americans have to suffer in, in terms of racism. Ferguson is a public health problem. And again, these numbers, if I can get up here. Again, it's not just African Americans. A big proportion of the population in the US don't live as many years and suffer much, much more. A 
of these diseases. So you're thinking, so what can we do? I mean, these are, these isms are hard, and it's, this is kind of depressing. So I just want to tell a quick story, um, just to give, end it on a positive note. This is Amanda uh, Torres. She's one of my students. She graduated. She's an alum. Um, and she's passionate about family planning. So she joined YouthLink, which is um, a group that sends youth out to foreign countries. She is passionate about family planning, but it's, this, is, this is Guatemala. You can't, you know, condoms aren't going to work there. So what she did was she went to Michael's and bought $20 worth of beads. And she's, these are called fertility beads. So it basically, there's 30 of them, and it allows women to keep track of their fertility and know when they're fertile or not. It gives them a little bit of control over their fertility, and that's made all the difference. So it gives them control. It breaks that cycle of poverty, and a positive effect is made by just $20 at Michael's. So my final message to everyone is that public health, we need to start dealing with these these social justice issues, if you're truly going to affect public health. Thank you very much.